Today we are going to be looking closely at the life and work of one of the forgotten founding fathers of the United States, Dr. Joseph Warren. In his time, he was known as an orator and a patriot, a military officer, and a physician. But today he is largely forgotten. He was very important in the history of Old South Meeting House, having delivered some really pivotal speeches here in 1772 and 1775 that commemorated the Boston Massacre. Today we're happy to have with us Samuel Foreman, who is going to discuss Dr. Joseph Warren. He's gonna share his insights and his research about Joseph Warren with us today. Dr. Foreman himself is a physician. He's a scholar and a businessman. He's the president of Oak and Ivy Health Systems Incorporated and a visiting scientist at the Harvard University School of Public Health. And he has just published this book, which uh, is it's really uh, less than a month old. And uh, his, he did quite a bit of original research and scholarship, looking through Warren's own account books and other sources. So I hope that uh, you'll be able to find out some of his new insights into Warren's life and meaning today. And uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Samuel Foreman. Thank you. Thank you. I'm very happy to be here. Indeed, honored in that uh, there are very strong associations, which I'm going to touch on, and I have a feeling that many of you already know of uh, Dr. Joseph Warren with the pivotal uh, early revolutionary activities and pre revolutionary activities, amongst other things, that occurred right here at the Old South Meeting House. Uh, I myself am a member of the Old South Meeting House, and the, this series is a wonderful series, and it's great to see so many people come out. But I have to say that I have to maybe alter my view of Old South a little bit. The, the staff has been very gracious in having me here. And as I was waiting to speak with you, one of the staffers came up and very, very nicely uh, wanted to know whether I would have a nice cup of warm tea. And I mean, I'm back one hand, it's just so nice. And I understand there's tea available downstairs. And, and those uh, of you who haven't partaken already are encouraged to after the talk and we can meet and talk down there over a cup of tea. But given uh, the history of this particular place and the fact that the Boston Tea Party for two generations after it occurred was actually known as the destruction of the tea and was no party, that uh, I, I just had to wrap my mind around. Brought a smile to my face anyway. Uh, I'm very happy uh, to be here to speak about Joseph Warren. I wanted to cut uh, touch on several things, and I hope I can do this all in about uh, half an hour or so that we have allotted to keep this during the lunch hour. Uh, I wanted to touch on uh, some of uh, how I got to be interested in this, but really the historiography and the challenges of writing uh, a scholarly biography of Joseph Warren, only the third one ever written uh, of him. And um, uh, actually to give you a sample of, of uh, my methods and how, what I was able to do with this. Um, so uh, also we, I just wanted to index some of the major aspect of Joseph Warren's life just to come to a common denominator. And then uh, talk a little bit about his legacy, which in some ways is almost as interesting as his life and his achievements themselves. This picture. Um, copy uh, versions of it by John Trumbull uh, sit in uh, several museums, including the Boston Museum of Fine Arts. Uh, some of you may have seen it there. It rarely goes by its original title. You see it in all the history books as Bunker Hill or the Battle of Bunker Hill. Its original title is The Death of Major General Joseph Warren at the Battle of Bunker's Hill, June 17th, 1775. 
It is the earliest of the icons of American history. That is, American historical paintings that were deliberately painted to capture the American experience and to extol virtues of the Confederation and the Republic. This was sketched out in 1785, was painted in 1786. So of all the icons of American history, this is the earliest of them. John Trumbull went to great lengths to track down the people involved, including some of the key British people, and to paint their likenesses and to include them in this picture. Really, when you consider it, it's, it's quite magnificent uh, um, in the historical painting genre. But also as to how Joseph Warren was remembered and extolled in the years immediately after his demise. This is the Confederation period of the 1780s. Uh, Joseph Warren being lionized as a general, the fighting patriot, the, the martyr, if you will. And indeed, uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that legacy. <laughs> Joseph Warren was nationally famous. I think it's kind of hard to conceive of it now for the first two generations after the Revolutionary War. Uh, Joseph Warren himself never traveled more than 75 miles outside of Boston. But there are Warren counties in Virginia, North Carolina, Georgia, Mississippi, Kentucky, Warren, Pennsylvania, Warren, Ohio, city, towns, all over the United States. Um, five of the 11 states that seceded from the Union have Warren counties named in the antebellum period of before the Civil War. That's kind of amazing for a Yankee boy like Joseph Warren, who never got down there. Locally, Warren is the fifth most common street name in eastern Pennsylvania. I think it's fair to people who live on Warren streets, uh, many of them probably don't know the legacy and the name for which their street is named. Plays, the first one of the first American subject play uh, was actually written during the Revolution by a fellow by the name of Brackenridge from Maryland about Joseph Warren at Bunker Hill. The first commercial play put on in Boston when it was first made legal to watch those evil plays was in 1797, John Daly Burke's play the death of General Warren at the Battle of Bunker's Hill. That play uh, not only played successfully in its run in Boston and New York, but uh, was a staple of July 4th celebrations for decades. And we already talked about the visual culture. So now, he has gone the other way. An audience like this, the Old South, faithful. You know who Joseph Warren was. But you could go, and I've done this, to the Museum of Fine Arts, where you walk into the magnificent American wing. And, and who do you face? Paul Revere. And you hang a left. And there's John Hancock and Samuel Adams, these beautiful John Singleton Copley pictures that, again, are in all the textbooks, both of history and art history. Wonderful pictures. And Joseph Warren and Mercy Otis Warren. And I just stand there and listen to people, visitors from all over, locals, saying, who's this person? He doesn't belong here. Interesting. Uh, I've gone to Charlestown, neighborhood, Bunker Hill. You could walk around. I would say probably the majority of the people you would meet on the street who live in Charlestown have no idea who Joseph Warren was despite the fact that the Bunker Hill Monument, in essence, is a monument in part to him. Interesting, that extreme fall from national prominence to being virtually unknown in his own hometown. How does that happen? I, I actually devoted some thought to that. There are some folks who cherish the legacy. The Massachusetts Masons, Harvard Medical School, that, that uh, lion in the medical school symbol is the symbol of the Warren family, Massachusetts General Hospital. Now, some of these cherish Warren 
as an ancestor of their favorite Warren, who was a descendant. Uh, although the Charlestown militia, bless their hearts, their reenactors, very explicitly keep alive and want to magnify the positive legacy of this involved uh, patriot. And they've been commemorating his birth at Forest Hills and a number of other things. The blog Boston 1775 uh, isn't explicitly devoted to Joseph Warren, but in fact to all the characters of this time frame. Uh, Mr. Bell, uh, uh, for his scholarship and his wonderful sense of humor, I think is probably known to some in this audience, but he has also devoted some time to uh, Warren-related stories. And the Bunker Hill Monument. Uh, some of the uh, houses along the Freedom Trail uh, will commemorate Warren at very various levels of prominence, of which Old South is an example given the uh, exhibit case in the back. Um, Joseph Warren has been commemorated and is currently in fiction. And I think that that is actually an artifact in part of the magnetic personality that you start to appreciate if you get into some of the primary documents, but also the fact that so many of them are missing. Original documents written by Ma Warren are extremely rare, unlike some of the other founding figures who have collections of volumes and volumes of George Washington's writings and Thomas Jefferson and you name it. Uh, even some of the minor figures who had lived uh, uh, a long time like El Elbridge Gerry and, and that sort of thing, have magnificent collections and papers, and descendants who, uh, who uh, have magnified their contributions. But Warren, uh, very little uh, survived from Warren, and that artifact makes nonfiction very difficult. Um, some of the people who got interested in this read the book Johnny Tremaine by Esther Forbes. Esther Forbes had written a wonderful biography of uh, Paul Revere, and I sense that he pro she probably would have wanted to write a biography of Joseph Warren, but I think she probably tripped over the glaring gaps in the historical record and what survived. So instead, uh, captured a character in fiction, which I believe is one of the more compelling char uh, characterizations of Warren to get a feel for probably who he really was but it takes fiction to do that. Uh, there's some novels out following Joe um, by uh, Dr. Eurelis, um, uh, who, who emphasizes uh, Joseph Warren's Masonic and medical aspects. Uh, it's uh, so uh, realistic so far as the medical aspects that I had to track down Dr. Eurelis to tell the difference between what was documented fact and what was fiction. I mean, it was that good <laughs> as fiction, as the fool me. Um, Janet Ular has a uh, novel that she's written in the last few years, which uh, is carefully researched and, and, and actually depicts Warren more for, uh, as a religiously observant uh, uh, character, and it is uh, largely true to the surviving record, as, as scant as that is. Um, on the right is something that may not be as familiar to you, but I find compelling. It's a web comic book called The Dreamer, and it is a romance comic book that is serialized week to week and has been going on for several years now. It has an intense uh, following that's very unlike my gray hair and some of the demographics in this room. It, 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 it has an especial appeal to young women, uh, high school and college age, and they, they focus in on the Warrens, amongst other characters, as romantic leads in this fictional depiction. What strikes me, though, uh, about it is how accurate this is. Uh, the left is the sketch of Joseph Warren, which was carefully done by the artist, Laura Innes, by studying the pictures of Joseph Warren at uh, the Museum of Fine Arts and depicting a somewhat slimmed down version from the pointy fellow that you may see, you may recall from the Warren portrait. In fact, my belief in researching uh, John Singleton Copley and how he depicted men was that paunchy, successful look was a look that Warren actually adopted or requested 
as did many uh, merchants and others in that time frame. And there is a credible piece of clothing, a waistcoat, that's at the ancient and honorable artillery company, which if it has not been altered, depicts a, a considerably slimmer warren. It's on the fourth floor of the Faneuil Hall. You should look at it. Um, so at any rate, the warren as a romantic lead. Now on the, on the face of it, it sounds almost preposterous, and we don't like to, uh, many of us don't th naturally think of our founding figures this way. But I I'll tell you, after researching the primary documents and, and everything that has been known to exist about Warren and finding some, some discovery documents, so-called, uh, as well, that a Warren did have such an appeal. Um, one of the earliest American historians, William Gordon, characterized Joseph Warren, in addition to his wonderful political and uh, military contributions, uh, he remarked that the ladies judged him handsome. <laughs> so indeed, the dreamer's onto this, and I found some evidence that that indeed was the case. Uh, just to uh, index some of his life, because I think what happened was in the lionizing of Joseph Warren's military contributions, which were very brief. And he was appointed a major general, and within three or four days, he went out to the Battle of Bunker Hill and was killed there. Now, he did have some prior military uh, um, work and leadership uh, in the Committee of Safety and in some of the skirmishing uh, in the early months of the Siege of Boston, but he had a very brief military career. His career was as a physician for the most part, and he was seeing patients all the way up to the eve of the outbreak of the Revolutionary War uh, in April uh, the 18th in the evening, 1775. Um, some outlines uh, are known of his early practice. Uh, he grew up in Roxbury, he was born in 1741. Uh, he was um, a milk boy in this uh, diversified farm. Their apples, the Warren russets, were well known and well distributed at the time. You can still buy them at farm, farmer's markets in the fall if you can find somebody who grows them. He went to Harvard, graduated in 1759. Uh, he apprenticed in medicine to Dr. Lloyd, who was a prominent physician in Boston at the time. Dr. Lloyd had trained in uh, Europe, which was the most prestigious way to get trained. But the majority of the families of the middle class uh, could not afford to send their children to Europe. Uh, and the medical school in Philadelphia at that time was not open for very long. There was no al local alternative. So you apprenticed to uh, the best physician you could. Warren was an orphan. His dad had died falling out of a Warren Russet apple tree in 1755, and his mother, Mary Stevens Warren was able to keep the farm and the family together, and even despite these hardships, uh, send uh, Joseph to college from 1755 to 59. Uh, she had to mortgage part of the farm at one point in order to do that. Uh, Joseph started uh, his practice in 1763, uh, just a couple of months in Roxbury, and then moved it into Boston. Very little known, uh, there was no anecdote surviving of uh, his early practice, uh, with the exception that within the year there was a smallpox epidemic in Boston, and he served as the house physician at a smallpox inoculation hospital, which was set up uh, with mutual cooperation of the physicians of Boston and the town government. It was a gutsy thing to do. It's unclear whether Joseph Warren himself was immune to smallpox. So here he is with hundreds of patients deliberately inoculating them with live smallpox, which he could have contracted. So it was heroic in a medical kind of way, and uh, it was well recognized. It also had brought him into uh, interactions with all kinds of people in Boston in the area, including some of the most prominent families like the Hutchinsons, who sent their children to be inoculated at the hospital and had uh, some unknown interactions, but presumably close interactions, between Joseph 
and the concerned parents that these inoculations would go well. Now this isn't, for those who know uh, even a little bit about medical history, this isn't the cowpox inoculation or immunization of Jenner from 1799. No, this is inoculate you with live smallpox in the hopes that the controlled disease was less lethal than the one you would catch in the wild way. And indeed it was, they kept statistics. You were probably 10 to 20 times more likely to do well after one of these deliberate inoculations than if you caught wild smallpox. However, even so, you had a one in 100 chance of dying from the inoculation. Kind of hard to imagine in modern terms, but that was hugely better than the alternative, and Joseph Warren's right on the front lines. Um, he uh, uh, pursued a um, newspaper war on a malpractice case with Thomas Young, who's even less known than Joseph Warren. Thomas Young named the state of Vermont. I think that's what he's remembered for. But anyway, he was a son of liberty. The two of them were at each other with something like the Worldwide Wrestling Foundation in print. It's very diverting. And I quote it at length. It's, Joseph shows this devilish sense of humor, uh, very sharp reasoning, um, acid wit. Uh, he's writing under a pseudonym, Philo Physique, the lover of medicine. When I, I was trained as an historian back in my undergraduate days, longer ago than I'd want to admit, and I was intrigued uh, by the story of Warren. I majored in the American Revolution, history of science, and I was always one to be attracted to the source documents as opposed to the secondary histories of people what said what happened. And I was struck by this guy, Warren. He was the go-to person of the late colonial and early revolutionary periods. The key documents are just rife with him, uh, the um, uh, Suffolk resolves, even when he's not present, the presentation of the Suffolk Resolves uh, by Paul Revere as a writer, uh, adopted word for word by the First Continental Congress, all have Warren's fingerprints on them. For that, he seems to come out of nowhere, and some historians have recognized that way, from the summer of 1774 to these um, Battle of Lexington and Concord and Bunker Hill when he dies, like a shooting star comes out of nowhere. Well, I was curious. First of all, his resume was beyond belief to me. Uh, he just had reached his 34th birthday. He was a leading physician in Boston. He was the president pro tem of the Provincial Congress, making him the de facto governor of Massachusetts. He was the head of its secretive committee of safety the head of the Massachusetts militias and its Minutemen. Oh, Chief Mason in North America, forgot that. And the ladies judge him handsome. <laughs> As a young man, I was intrigued by that. I just, but I had an attitude. This can't be true. And I was just itching to get into this, you know, well, which part of it wasn't true? <laughs> and that sort of thing. About uh, six years or so ago, my business interests were such that I could take some time to revisit this. And living in Boston, I found that the most voluminous um, records of Warren's in his hand are his account books. They were known to the previous biographers, Frothingham in 1865, John Carey in 1961, but they didn't know what to make of them. They're in a Latin abbreviation for a kind of medical practice that's so arcane that nobody can make heads or tails of it. They're essentially financial documents, right? And they have various asides about other things that crept in there because apparently Joseph wasn't that meticulous of a businessman. Uh, and they're incomplete at that. And so I approach these things first in kind of an aesthetic way. I'm going to touch the book that the Patriot had touched. And after doing that for a while, I realized, as I was thumbing through this thing, that there's some very interesting things about this account book. And in fact, it might be a entree 
to Joseph Warren to, to uh, understand him uh, from his early development and as a person. And that would take some trek. So I, I had some advice, some wonderful advice, Professor David Hackett Fisher, who's a well-known author in, in this area, and I gave him an example of a, uh, a previously unsuspected uh, relationship that was suggested by the account books, and he encouraged me to go on, and in fact, this was potentially fruitful. So the method, basically, that I adopted was to look at the account books and uh, look for relationships, uh, interactions that seemed compelling, unknown, and then go to where they pointed, the peoples who are named, their surviving diaries and letters, and dig down very deep to see what happened during this time frame. And uh, I'm going to give you an example of one of those things. Now, these account books are sitting there in an active medical office between 1763 and 1775, which is before the antibiotic era. And, and the rules of the, um, the archives is to, uh, that's what they look like on the inside, but look at that blotch there on the right. It's a lot of that kind of stuff. And, and the rules of the archives are to wear, you know, white gloves when you handle this sort of thing. And, and, and uh, you certainly don't want to damage these priceless documents. But frankly, as a physician, I was a little spooked. I know it doesn't make sense, but I would take the white gloves off, and when I would go, I would wash my hands very, very thoroughly. Uh, I uh, transcribed the uh, count books. I have some background in business. I was able to actually reconstruct forensically some of the missing account books by some modern database management. I had to work with these things for 50 days to transcribe the entire existing account books into database. And then once, once you're there, you can manipulate it in various ways that I describe in the appendix of the book. But historiographically, it, it, it allows you to get at some of the order and timing of which he was involved with that suggested things that no one ever knew. Uh, there's an account, Mr. John Wheatley, Taylor. John Wheatley, merchant, same, same. I thought that was very interesting because it was one of the first accounts open when Joseph Warren opened his practice in Boston in the summer of 1763, this black hole in his development. Nobody knows anything about it. And uh, so I uh, looked at that very closely and uh, saw some interesting things about it that one of the first patients, or family of patients, of Dr. Warren was Phyllis Wheatley. And there were some interesting things about this account that uh, led me to look more closely at the demographics of the people involved and other things that happened in Joseph Warren's life at the time to piece together, and this is speculative history, I would be the first to admit, um, a scenario of what his interactions with the Wheatley family might have been like. Now, I want to say that one of the things I did historiographically is that I reproduce at great length original documents, transcriptions of Warren, so if you don't agree with my interpretations, you can see that for yourself. I took the convention, which might irritate some people, but except for the scholars, of using original spellings, original capitalization, original punctuation, and lack thereof, you can see what I was seeing when I was able to get that sort of thing. In some cases, I was using official transcriptions of documents that had been cleaned up somewhere along the line. So when I'm talking fact, it's very clear these endnotes uh, would meet scholarly expectations. Uh, where I speculate, I say, could be, I'm speculating, there's no question, you know, like if I'm extrapolating, that's what I'm doing, right? I know some modern books getting into people that have some gaps don't make that difference. And there's some fiction in there and sometimes you can't tell. Uh, I was, my history teacher is 30, 40 years ago, that's anathema, and I brought that with me. At the extent that maybe it's not always the smoothest narrative. Let me give you an example of what I did with this. 
And this is a, a reading from the book. Wheatley Family Care. So Joseph Warren comes to Boston, one of his first patients is Mr. John Wheatley, who the account books also showed was his landlord. Mr. Wheatley found it convenient to obtain medical care for himself and his household from the young physician. Daughter Mary Wheatley took ill early in February 1764, possibly from a complication of her smallpox inoculation. Joseph closely and frequently attended to her, whom he familiarly identified as Miss Polly in his accounts. Perhaps Mary Wheatley, then a year or so Joseph's junior, encouraged such close attendance. She may have shared the opinion concerning the young physician that, quote, the ladies judged him handsome, unquote. Father Wheatley may have grown concerned that the ambitious bachelor was paying too much attention to his nubile daughter. Observing this drama, and perhaps conscripted as a sounding board to Miss Mary Wheatley, was the preternaturally talented enslaved servant Phyllis. Just a few years from being purchased off the Boston docks from the ship captain who had transported her from Africa, the preteen domestic already exhibited an uncanny aptitude and facility for the English language and its literature. Goings on in the Wheatley household would have been an introduction for Phyllis to the mating rituals of the white colonial middle class. I wonder if Phyllis Wheatley in turn made an impression on Joseph Warren. She may have been under his direct care at one point. She would have been in close proximity to her ill mistress in the Wheatley household as Joseph Warren was in attendance. One can conjure a scenario where Phyllis, the Wheatley daughter, and Joseph engaged in an impromptu interchange, quoting Pope, Addison's Cato, and Roman classical poets, much as Joseph enjoyed bantering with his fellow Harvard alumni. Such interactions are purely speculative. Yet I find it hard to believe that Joseph Warren wouldn't be impressed by the possibilities of human nature unbound by racial stereotypes if he spoke and interacted with Phyllis Wheatley. Surviving documentation does not reveal Warren's opinions on chattel slavery of Africans. He never took a public stance on the issue. Private and professional actions hint at a complex formulation. Some patriots, like his associate John Hancock, decried unrepresentative taxation as slavery while they owned black slaves prior to the Revolutionary War. Others, like James Otis, publicly and consistently decried enslavement of every kind. In 1770, Joseph Warren bought an African domestic slave boy, though no other details of that episode survive. Warren's medical practice was notably blind to race. There was no Jim Crow or back of the bus in Joseph Warren's clinical practice. Whether one was John Hancock or Dada Boses, an otherwise unknown slave, Joseph Warren attended them in the order of their appearance with an intensity dictated by clinical need and with the same treatments for all. The philosophy behind such an approach was summed up by one of the dynasty of Warren physicians who emulated Joseph's example. Quote, when in distress, every man becomes our neighbor, unquote. This simple humanitarian practice style, evident in Joseph Warren's actions, if not his words, and unrecorded by contemporaries, may have impressed the young Phyllis. With respect to Dr. Warren's ministrations to Mary Wheatley outlasting the clinical need, Mr. John Wheatley may have wanted better for his daughter than for her to marry a Roxbury farmer's orphan. 
Better to terminate the arrangement before anything serious might happen. John Wheatley paid off his debt in full to the young doctor and terminated all further services to the family on July 14, 1764. By then, Joseph Warren was courting another merchant's daughter, Elizabeth Hutton, whom he married seven weeks later. Now, you can see in that, I'm making a kind of a wild speculation that Joseph Warren had a nascent flirtation with John Warren, Merchant's daughter. And that's suggested by the uh, sequence of uh, care in the account books. The familiar reference to Polly versus the formal name Mary Wheatley. And uh, the demographics of the ages of the protagonists and, and what uh, Joseph and Mary Wheatley eventually did so far as their marriages and timing. Um, I wasn't comfortable in, in making a speculation like that without checking it, and that's true for all the book. So I tracked down uh, Professor Coretta, Vincent Coretta, whose um, authoritative biography of Phyllis Wheatley has recently come out, and who was writing his biography as I was writing this. And I, we compared notes. I laid out the facts uh, that I had seen, what was documented, what was speculative, what do you, biographer of Phyllis Wheatley, think of this? Well, what, he, what uh, Vincent told me was, this time frame was a black hole in the Wheatley story, both for Phyllis, for the owners, for the Wheatley children. He was hungry to know. He has footnotes about my book and the accounts in his book. He was very struck by this Polly Wheatley business. As for the rest of it, he said it's reasonable speculation, and we leave it at that. So in the book, I just read you that passage. The footnotes talk about all the original documents and uh, this language about could have, would have, that kind of thing, uh, identify that I'm speculating. Okay. Let's talk about another favorite, and I think favorite I use loosely. I was just in the, uh, one of the, um, standing before an exhibit in the back, identifying Thomas Hutchinson, lieutenant governor of Massachusetts, uh, later formally governor uh, after Francis Bernard left, acting governor and then formal governor, the hated Tory of the Tea Party meetings, arch enemy of the patriots. Really pretty bad guy. Well, he shows up here as a patient. Interesting. 1767, there's a lot of goings on uh, between folks who uh, were or later became patriots and Tories in the 1760s, so there wasn't anything untoward about that per se. But I did took this method of digging in very deeply into the Hutchinson papers. What happened on May 1st, 1767? Uh, I also found through the uh, trans, through the forensic um, reconstruction of the account books that Joseph Warren saw very few patients other than Thomas Hutchinson for, well, there was one period there of about 10, 11 days where he was the only patient of Thomas Hutchinson. Well, it turns out, I'm going to take a lot of time on this, it's in the book, uh, there uh, was a convening of the general court on May 1st, 1767, uh, the uh, Patriots were going to, or, or the Whigs, uh, as they were more commonly called at that time, uh, were going to take to, ta to task uh, Governor Bernard, and uh, Thomas Hutchinson called in sick, didn't show up, let Bernard out hang to dry, basically. Uh, Thomas Hutchinson said that he had a stroke, I'm not sure exactly what what he was talking about about that, but it's described in his letters, which I dive down very deeply into. Something serious happened to him. It's, it's unclear in modern medical terms what happened. But his choice of Joseph Warren may have had political overtones. Joseph Warren already uh, was, um, if not formally aligned with the Whigs, leaning towards them. So to have your physician be aligned with the Whigs gives a certain legitimacy to your absence. But there was more going on than that, too, because Warren already was writing anonymously 
uh, as Pascalos in late 1766-1767 as a non-aligned Whig, that is not formally aligned with the party but espousing Whig-like positions, which amongst other things though advocated that Thomas Hutchinson be reimbursed for the house that some of the mobs burned down in 1765, which was not a mainstream Whig uh, position. And then for the entire period covered in this account book, Joseph Warren was on an ostensibly medical topic as philophysique, excoriating patriot physician Thomas Young in a malpractice visit, or a malpractice dispute. So during the time that Hutchinson was Warren's patient, uh, Warren stepped back from overtly political activity into more medical activity. And I, I talk about how that, why that might have happened and how. But uh, one is left, just by the circumstance, wondering whether uh, Warren was flirting with the Tory cause at the time, or at least stepped back to think about it and silence some of his more strident uh, Whig positions. The fact that there was some kind of interaction and possibly a relationship between Joseph Warren and Thomas Hutchinson had never been suspected. Although it's hard to tell exactly what the significance of it was, the two of them were doctor and patient, and maybe something more, at least for a period during 1767. Okay, we're gonna skip ahead. Samuel Adams was uh, the political um, mentor of Joseph Warren. Uh, Paul Revere is a favorite here. Uh, I'm not gonna talk much about this, but uh, there are several aspects of Paul Revere and Joseph Warren interacting. They were apparently friends. Um, Paul Revere named one of his sons after Joseph Warren in the immediate aftermath of his, of his being killed. But, um, I think uh, decades later, and due to nothing that the protagonists did, the legend of Paul Revere emerged in the mid-19th century and displaced Joseph Warren in collective memory. And I talk about how that happens and some other things happened as well. I speculate on Joseph Warren's role in the Tea Party. It is officially unknown. And in fact, on all lists of Tea Party participants, even in the wonderful book written by Professor Karp very recently, Joseph Warren does not show up on the list of Tea Party participants. Never the fact, nevertheless, circumstances would suggest that he was up to his eyeballs in it. And I suspect, uh, I speculate as to how. Uh, we mentioned the Suffolk Resolves. Joseph Warren's practice on the eve of the American Revolution. There are some very unusual patients who you'd expect to be named in a way that you collect bills but aren't. Indian, Negro woman Zipporah, camp woman. Camp woman's a woman associated with the army. There's only one army in Boston in April 1775, the British Army. What was going on in Warren's practice on the eve of the American Revolution? I talk about that in the book. Some people say that Margaret Kemble Gage, the stunning woman, wife of the British general, was the source of Joseph Warren's uncannily accurate intelligence about British army movements that he assigned Paul Revere on that famous ride. I have fun with that in the book. I ultimately don't think that it happened. The footnotes talk about it in great detail on what the authority behind this is. Um, but uh, there's sufficiently, um, again, absence of documentation specific to Warren that I had fun with a, uh, a fictional episode <laughs> involving Joseph Warren and Margaret Kemble Gage, and then I refute it in the footnotes. Um, Joseph Warren's situational leadership at the Siege of Boston is just incredible. He, had, he, he, was, he was overseeing the Patriots and Militia besieging the British in Boston, the most powerful army and navy in the world at the time, with spit, glue, and a prayer. 
without really official sanction, militias from different provinces present and not recognizing any formal command, not enough gunpowder, not enough money, not enough anything. The delegates are off as Continental Congress uh, talking about uh, John Dickinson's um, uh, olive branch uh, approach. The war has already started. Joseph Warren's the point man to put this all together. He did. I think that that is his biggest contribution to the United States, and there's another one that I'm going to identify. Just all the different aspects that happened during the early part of the siege of Boston, including commissioning Benedict Arnold to attack Ticonderoga and capture and bring the cannons back to Boston to break the siege. Ethan Allen independently was on a separate mission at the same time. This, so the breaking of the siege of Boston was basically cast by Joseph Warren at the end of um, April 1775 and teed up the eventual success uh, of uh, General Knox, George Washington, that kind of thing. He was actually involved in teeing up the breaking of the siege. I, I, I don't think that's recognized at all. Uh, he managed to uh, have a fiance. His wife had died uh, in 1773. Um, Miss Mercy Scully said, without any documentation, to be a daughter of liberty, writer, and his fiance at the time that he died. I was able to reconstruct some of her life. I found 90 of her letters at the Cambridge Heart Historical Society, which very few people know about. And uh, even uh, that picture, Copley's mysterious lady in a blue dress, I believe to be Mercy Scully, though it officially is unattributed and has been mysterious as to who that sitter is for the last 250 years. Joseph Warren refused command at Bunker Hill because he had not been confirmed in his commission as general, thereby establishing the precedent of the primacy of elected government over the military, ultimately at the cost of his life. And I, I think that this is a major contribution of what Joseph Warren did. Uh, there, Joseph Warren comes out to Bunker Hill, meets uh, uh, General Putnam, who is a field commander there, trying to direct things as best he can. What does Putnam do? Offers the command to Joseph Warren. Warren refuses. And hence, this picture that we started with. We'll skip over these slides. A villain to some, including Thomas Hutchinson, and a hero to others. Joseph Warren, I believe, is an inspirational American. Uh, his national fame was amply justified, and I believe that we should cherish him more than we, in fact, do now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Foreman, for your informative talk. I apologize that we had to speed through some of that there. Um, but we are going over time, and we want to um, recognize your, your commitment to be here. Uh, Dr. Er, Foreman will be downstairs in the museum shop signing his book. And if you have any additional questions, including the lingering one that he, he implied in his email newsletter interview, where he suggested that perhaps Old South was responsible for uh, Dr. Warren's legacy going into obscurity a bit. So perhaps he'd answer for you down in the museum shop exactly how we did that. Uh, you guys are welcome to join him downstairs. And we uh, thank you very much for coming and joining us today. And thank you for hearing me out. <laughs>